people on the list to testify today. So I, what I'm going to do is just see who wants to testify today and make a list here, and we'll just start going through it because we don't have a bill to actually respond to. We're just kind of taking um, a general testimony. I believe that um, we were going to do a committee bill, which is on the deadline for that is this Friday. To Actually, it has to be voted out by Thursday noon. So that means there isn't much time to take all the testimony and ask our council to draft it for us in a way that's thoughtful instead of rushing it through, and then get testimony on the bill itself. So we are going to use um, the S305. S305, which is the uh, Senator Brock's bill about non-private, uh, uh, governmental sponsored private organizations, as, as close as I can come to. Nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit, yeah. Um, to uh, require them to comply with public records laws. We're going to use that for a vehicle to put all of our thoughts on. It doesn't mean that that bill will be as it is, because we'll take testimony on that bill in particular. But that's, that's what we're going to use so that we don't have to try to get it out of here by Friday, just so that people know that that's what we're doing. So from now on, I guess we might as just as well put the bill number on when we're doing it, which is S305, and then we can take testimony on that in particular and on anything else that we want to put in there. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. OK. It's not OK. That is in our committee. OK. Yeah. Yeah, it is here. So all right. So who, is, who wants to testify today? Oh, committee's over. <laughs> all right. Thank you for your attendance and your wise words of wisdom uh, to us. But um, OK. Nobody wants to testify? I, I do, but I would hope to be more prepared uh, in the context of it. It was comments that, well. Do you want to testify? Sure. OK. And who, nobody else has a desire to testify here on either uh, Senator Brock's bill or the general idea or anything? We have heard from Sure. OK, I thought you might. We also are getting, um, one of the things that we talked about last time was records management. And if you have good records management, it would be easier to comply with public records requests. And we said, oh, maybe we could uh, have the archivist do some research on who, which agencies comply, which agencies have better systems and stuff. Turns out that she already does that. So we will have, this will be delivered to us from the um, printing office shortly. And um, we have that. OK. So I, I'm going to say one. We had one conversation this morning with Jeff Wallens, who's the director, uh, or ED, or whatever he's called, of VCIC. And, um, it was very interesting because we, as a committee, did a lot of kind of scratching our heads and trying to figure out what they charge $30 for a criminal background check. And most of the criminal background checks that they charge for, I mean, you, you can ask for your own, your own, and that's, there's no charge to that. And most of them are from uh, primarily out-of-state companies who are doing employee background checks. So we had a discussion about, well, should they be charging for those, and what we came to the conclusion was that that's a, they're charging for a service, they're not charging for the record. Because the person, if I want a criminal background check on Senator Collimore, I could go to every law enforcement agency in the state and I could get that free. It's, there's no charge for it, it's there. I could get that. What the VCIC does is provides the service of gathering them all and giving them to you, and for an employer, it's a lot easier to pay $30 than to go to 85 agencies. 
So they're paying for the service, not for the, the record. So we, I think, kind of put that one aside unless anybody has any issues with that. You want to? Okay. Uh, I'll start with the vehicle bill, Senator Rock's bill. Mm -hmm. As most of you may know, I, in 2015 or so, made public records requests related to the health information technology plan of Vermont information technology leaders. They responded that they were a nonprofit, private nonprofit, and not uh, subject to the public records law. Yet they were commissioned and delegated by the legislature to create a health information infrastructure of medical electronic medical records. Over the last decade or so, they've spent over $50 million. I wanted to know where that money went. Uh, was the intellectual property preserved in their contracts with subcontractors, as was required by the grant agreements with the Department of Vermont Health Access? Uh, they persisted, and I took them to Superior Court. Um, and it took a year or so, and fifteen thousand dollars. And Judge Teach ruled that, subject to a three-pronged test, a private nonprofit can be the fun. What she, her decision ruled that it's the functional equivalent of a state agency, and they are subject to public records law. It's a whole different can, can of worms of whether they're subject to open meeting law th that needs to be addressed, but I don't think we're gonna, you're going to have time this session to do that in this bill. Um, the $50 million in intellectual property has seems to have disappeared, um, and I don't have the resources to try to use public records law to fish out the records from vital of where that went. But when the legislature directed uh, the Attorney General's office to inquire where did the intellectual property go, they basically threw up their hands and said there is none. But where it, where it went, that money went was to create interfaces between the health information exchange software and all the different practice management systems that the nurses and blood labs, et cetera, use so that they all can display data in a common format. Uh, and that apparently was forfeited uh, to Medicity, which is a subsidiary of Aetna, which is now a subsidiary of CVS. So you've got a, a drug company owning an insurance company, owning a medical records company, and they seem to have absconded with $50 million of Vermont intellectual property that was specifically withheld in the con contracts the grant agreements from the Department of Vermont Health Access to Vermont Information Technology Leaders. So I've been trying to get the AG to look into that uh, for years, but I'm only asking for 5%, 10% if we get it back. <laughs> uh, just kidding, for the record. Uh, Stephen Whitaker, by the way, for the record. Uh, records management, public records access. I. I am a frequent user of the public records law. I make requests mostly for the purpose of holding state officials accountable for statutory obligations like writing a telecommunications plan or making sure that when a fiber breaks due to a, a bridge washout that it doesn't necessarily take down state agency offices and public libraries from the internet. So resiliency, redundancy, hardening. Uh, what I frequently find is almost every request I make is now responded with the, we need an extra 10 days. And frequently ADS, for instance, which has no oversight body to uh, appeal to, um, I've been asking since the November uh, storm November 1st storm, a uh, fiber broke, which took out state offices down in Addison County. It took out public libraries, which are managed by uh, the Agency of Digital Service for some obscure reason. Um, so Kellogg Hubbard Library lost its internet connectivity that day too. But 
there was also a outage related to a data center flooding. It was a combination. It was a perfect storm of things went wrong that day, and it hasn't yet made the press because they're withholding the records and delaying and delaying and delaying availability of those records. Um, I saw John Quinn today and asked him about them yet again. So they offered $288 a fee, which is significant to me. Um, I said, I'll inspect them and just choose the ones I need copies of. I do not want to pay front $288 for documents which might be so redacted they're useless. Uh, another set of records, requests are made, inconsistent application of exemptions. The agencies need guidance on how to apply claims of exemption because some of the smaller phone companies around Vermont, when they have a power outage that blocks 911 service, they say 26 lines or 40 lines were affected that couldn't, for so many hours, this number of people could not call 911. But yet, Consolidated Communications claims that the number of lines affected, which are typically much greater, uh, are exempt. And the department, uh, in this case, the 911 board, just doesn't second guess that, doesn't push back. The idea that we're not allowed to know how many people are affected by a 911 outage is absurd. In my, there's no trade secret there, you know? Is that what they claim, that it's a trade secret? Yes, proprietary or trade secret. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on FirstNet. There's not a lot to go on there. I will call your attention to a new report issued yesterday from the Government Accountability Office, which dug deep into FirstNet's uh, contract. The GAO auditors were able to review the contract, which has been secret for years. None of the states, which have opted in to FirstNet, as did Vermont, have seen the contract, nor does Vermont have any recourse if they don't adhere to the terms of that plan or contract. Um, but the auditor at GAO dug deeply into that and found that they're not complying with the terms of the contracts for scheduling, for public engagement, for issuing reports which were specifically required to be biannually released and not subject to proprietary claims. So FirstNet's a mess and Vermont needs to, at the scale of Vermont government and our commitment to transparency, Vermont could have a significant effect. Our former governor, Douglas, served on the national FirstNet board for several years. So we may be able to leverage that impact into turning that into a more transparent. Our telecommunications planning process is supposed to be transparent and engaged with the public. You can't do that if you claim your entire project is secret and proprietary to AT&T. And our Department of Public Safety is managing that. And having meetings of subcommittees of the governance advisory board, which they call working groups, and therefore they didn't have to adhere to open meeting law or keep minutes, um, even though the Secretary of State clearly has uh, stood firm that a, a working group is a subcommittee for, for the purpose of open meeting law. So we've got overly broad claims of exemption. It's whatever AT&T chooses to say is exempt. Uh, our auditor of accounts this morning told me he got asked for a contract about the VTEL grant from the federal government. But apparently the federal government allowed VTEL to decide what was proprietary and he got 60 or 80 or 100 and something pages of black. Um, so that's an area that really needs clarification is who decides. And I would like to support the call for an ombudsman because Many of the agencies know that I don't have the thousands of dollars to bring suit every time they fly in the face of the law. Um, and an ombudsman would uh, have a greater authority to let them know that if this does have to go to court, they're going to lose, you know, uh, likely lose. So I, I, I'm in support of that. 
I did some freedom of information work in Connecticut as a project where computer maps were claimed to be exempt. This is before Google Maps. Um, and the police chief was cross-examined and he said the only people who would want to look computer maps would be terrorists and jewel thieves. And uh, I prevailed and that had to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Connecticut and I prevailed on that one. So some of the agencies, one, here's a problem that was created by the le legislature back in 2013. The Finance Committee passed a broadband bill creating a connectivity division. The Department of Public Service already had authority to require information from the carriers for the development of a telecommunications plan. That's in 202D. In 202, they added a 202E, and they said voluntarily provided information from the carriers can be subject to non-disclosure agreements. So now here we are trying to build broadband for everyone and the only people that have any data on where the fiber is or what the claim service served addresses are is the department and they can't give it out. So we've created this kind of conundrum where you've got two different competing and I asked the department, I did a public records request for all the records that they requested from the carriers in preparation of the 2018 draft telecommunications plan. They asked for none using that 202D authority. They used it under the 202E and they entered non-disclosure agreements. So you can't really have public participation in a telecom plan. So these are some of the problems, but they've claimed thousands of dollars they want from me to go about redacting records uh, that I've asked for. And I just, I mean, if I thought y'all would uh, be impressed with lots of redacted records, I might try to, you know, get that uh, redacted set just to show you how absurd it is. But this is an area that the overbroad use of the 10 day extensions, and then they're considering that even after the 10 days, then they can start the redactions. No, the, the way the law reads, if you ask for a 10 day extension because you need to consult other agencies, under no circumstance can you extend beyond the 10 days before you make the records available. Whereas they're claiming 10 days to think about it and talk about it, and then if you cough up the money, then they'll start the redactions. Um, these are areas where the, the, the law is not working. Um, is it because the law is unclear or because it's um, just not being followed? The law is unclear. Um, or the law could be more clear. I'm not saying it's unclear and forfeiting, waiving my rights to, <laughs> to litigate it. Uh, I want to use another example that EPUC, under the prior law, the Department of Information and Innovation was required to write a plan annually and update it annually of every system that they intended to invest public money in. And part of that planning required an assessment of the impacts on public access to the records that were going to be included in that system, as well as impact on privacy of personally identifiable information to be included in that system. Those requirements, planning requirements, were unfortunately uh, repealed last year uh, against my better, my advice and better judgment. So I think you. I would encourage you to think carefully about reinstating uh, plan specific planning requirements. Ironically, the broadband bill just passed last year really tightened up the planning requirements for the 10-year telecommunications plan. So that's the model I would encourage you to look at. 202C under Title 30 is the goals, the statutory goals for our telecommunications uh, systems and infrastructure. 202D is the planning requirements intended to reach those goals. So that that uh, dual uh, structure would be most valuable in applied to the health IT plan that's currently supervised by the Green Mountain Care Board. The 
uh, economic development strategy is another one. The we need a 911 plan. The 911 has not been fleshed out as a system in the DII plans for years. So not only did we create a new agency of digital services without having ever completed the plan to the requirements of statute, we then repealed the statute entirely. So all they give you is a report. These are the, so that's a, that's a problem. But looking forward as, as a governance model, each of these plans, if you clarify the goals, have the committee of jurisdiction clarify the goals for each of the plans and tighten up the planning requirements and then have a, a governance council make sure that those plans fit together. That would be good technology governance because each one has got milestones to meet for performance every year and then did it conflict or integrate with other strategies. That's enough for today. Because I don't want to lose your... Yeah, and I think <coughs> of the getting into the planning requirements is a little... Sure. Is a little beyond the um, Let me, public records, but I... Can I give you one I more example on the nonprofits? Uh, yes. Half a million dollars a year is granted by the Office of Economic Opportunity at the Agency of Human Services to a nonprofit in Barrie, which is providing some level of services and oversight and management to a 34-bed shelter in Barrie called Good Samaritan, and seasonally from November to April, a 20-bed shelter in Montpelier, which does not have a year-round shelter, and a 14-bed shelter in Barrie. The, there's chronic staffing problems. There are reportedly agreements made with the day shelter another way here on Berry Street that are not kept. And the, one of the prior staffs there told me that that resulted in two deaths. There's been deaths at the Good Samaritan Haven. The police chief in Barry tells me that a person who was flagged as a uh, registered sex offender did not have to register because that's not considered an address. So the Barry police chief would not know that a registered sex offender is in his community. So, but I've done public records requests of the Good Samaritan Shelter and they say, we're going to ignore you. We don't have to. Are they completely funded by the state? Are they set up by the state? They, like the same they are as not, no, they're not created by the state. They are, they, they're a 501c3. Okay. They get most of their funding, but right. the state does not dictate their governance. So this is an area where we may need to start putting conditions of some dictated governance, not dictated, but required legislative governance in order to make sure that those public records uh, obligations attached. I think we have on a separate um, conversation we've talked about um, some oversight over 501c3s that we really as a state have no no oversight and I know I, I know some in my area that have their boards have completely violated their their personnel rules and their all their um, and I know I, others where directors have and the board just doesn't. So we've talked, that's a different conversation about the kind of level of um, oversight we see of 501c3s. I would distinguish between 501c3s that are, you know, playing classical music versus ones that are providing a direct service that the government has advocated on. In, in effect, sheltering homeless people is something that the city of Montpelier should be directly the recipient of that OEO money and then hold the the managing entity to a strict oversight role. But when you give the money directly to a nonprofit without triggering these uh, accountability provisions, it creates problems. Thank you for your time. Anybody? Brian? No. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Novotny for the Vermont okay. Police Elizabeth, Association. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just called you Beth. I'm sorry. No, no, it's, it's fine, Beth. It's fine. Uh, 
So at 50,000 feet on public records as we move forward, and I'll be happy to come back in if I have, a, if I have something in particular to comment on. Uh, transparency is the goal of public records, and it's, uh, it's also about weighing the privacy interests of, of folks who deserve some uh, consideration. So in the case of law enforcement records, if you are investigating a homicide case and you're interviewing three or four witnesses and they provide personal information as part of their testimony that relates to them. It might be a medical issue they're talking about. Maybe it's uh, cell phone information. We recognize the need to um, uh, protect that information because it isn't relevant to the activity of law enforcement. In other words, it doesn't shed that transparent light on law enforcement's activities, so we try to strike that balance. And I get that that is what uh, the current law tries to do. I will say that for agencies, the challenge is this. Um, you know, the simple public records request is fairly easy to respond to and those get taken care of. But the public records law can be, and I'll say this, and I don't mean in a pejorative way, but it can be weaponized to the extent that someone could ask for just an enormous amount of records that places an enormous burden on a small public entity. Um, and the challenge for them is how to respond. It isn't that they don't want to be transparent, it's that they don't have the resources uh, to manage those kinds of records requests. And so if we're going to move towards a responsive government, we would ask that there be an investment whatever that looks like that allows for personal resources and advisory resources so people can, in government, do the right thing uh, and in a timely manner. And that takes human resources, advisory resources, and, um, and in some cases equipment. Because um, it's as simple as trying to redact a document uh, without having to run it through the copier machine three times. So I would ask that whatever you're doing in the area of public records, you keep that in mind. Um, and I know that you're considering potentially, I don't know if this committee is considering inquests, but we would like at some point the opportunity to come in and talk about that. How about inquest proceedings? Will that be, is that going to be part of your public records request? I mean, public we records? Don't know. We don't have a bill yet, so we're just taking everything. Okay. And if, it, if it's important, then we should put it in there? Nope. I just wanted to, um, at 50,000 feet, say that is where the tension lies. That I think there are people in uh, agencies and in public entities that want to do the right thing, but they struggle with the necessary resources to be able to achieve that outcome in a way that's satisfactory to everybody. So how would, how would you do that if you had, would you have a, um, we have a potential pool for, for example, public funding for um, campaigns, publicly funded campaigns. We don't actually have the money, but if somebody qualifies for it, then they can access a pool of money. And that pool of money, in this case, comes from the Secretary of State's office. So would you have like a pool of money and if an agency had, most requests don't take a lot of time and don't take a lot of energy. So they're just done with, but if an agency or department had a, an abnormal, maybe I should say request that did take a lot of energy, they would draw from that pool? How, do you know how, have well, you thought about how you would do that? I know what it would look like in an ideal world, and that would be every entity has in-house someone who can advise them on the law, so that be that legal advice, that component, so that they could be in compliance. They'd have someone who's dedicated at least a person, in some agencies you'd probably have to have more, to receiving and responding to those so that there's some consistency. Uh, and as, of course, as they, as they do that, they also gain knowledge and become less reliant on the legal advisor because they they become better at it. Um, you need the appropriate, literally, copying equipment that is effective at rea redacting. And I don't know what kind of redacting equipment there is out there. So there would be a pool of money necessary. I can tell you that. And I don't know beyond what you're talking about is worth exploring, but I can only tell you what a perfect world looks like. And I'm not sure we can get there. 
so you're probably imagining something in between and I at least applaud you for trying to come up with some solution because you know while we have examples of public officials maybe making the wrong call and that happens some of them make that wrong call in good faith some of them make that wrong call in bad faith uh, but I think you're going to take care of about 90 9% of your issues if they have the resources they need to make the right call and that they can respond to some of these more difficult requests in a timely manner. And we've just set this system up that uh, I get the media's need for records and why people need them in a certain period of time. All of that's understandable and there's this tension and the question is how do you resolve it and it takes resources, that's the bottom line. Isn't every agency, maybe Chris can talk to this when he comes up, every agency or every department is supposed to have a point person for public records and maybe they just assign the person who wasn't at the staff meeting that morning. I don't know how they do that, but... Um, yeah, you can be assigned that job, but that isn't your only job. Right, right. So, you know, uh, you want a person whose dedicated position is responding to public records and, and maybe, you know, you can pool resources and very small entities that know that they can share that person, uh, but it, it requires, I think, that level of attention. I mean, that's what was my experience in state government uh, and my experience outside of state government. That's my 50,000 foot view. And re remind me about the inquest, what you... Oh, that was, I thought that was enough part of another bill. There's a criminal justice bill that seeks to uh, make public inquest records. Remind me again what an inquest. It's like a grand jury proceeding. Oh, so so it's a charging it's a charging yeah. investigatory yeah. proceeding where prosecutors yeah. typically they would do it in cases where they are um, not quite sure of whether or what to charge. Yeah. A great example is Burlington used it once in an unsolved homicide and they had evidence of of well, they had an idea of who did it, and they thought they had evidence, and they wanted to see if the grand jury thought there was enough to charge. Um, and in that instance, my recollection is the grand jury did, but it was still a tough case for them, and they resolved it um, mm -hmm. by having him identify where the body was so they could make the family whole, and then he got a, a reduced sentence and a reduced charge. That was the deal they cut because it was a tough case. But the point of that grand jury proceeding is you can put that information in and in that particular inquest if, uh, and that was an, in, an in, excuse me, let me back up. An inquest is an information gathering tool for them to do in secret. Uh, so you would use the inquest to try to get information from witnesses who otherwise wouldn't cooperate with you. And the problem is in this particular bill, my recollection is that if there's no charging decision after that, the inquest records are public and that's the rub for law enforcement because if you have an ongoing unsolved homicide or an unsolved case where you might not actually end up charging through this investigatory secret proceeding then you will um, you, you know you potentially jeopardize investigation but that's another committee oh, okay. I'm on okay. I, I think the state's attorneys are responding to it I just that wasn't sure if that was on your plate Maybe it should be, but not here. Okay. Is it a house bill? It must be because... Jay here? Jay, do you know if, if that's a house bill? Are you familiar with that bill? I'm not familiar with that. I don't think it's in... I'm on judiciary. I don't remember seeing it there. Okay. So. Thank you for the record. <clears throat> Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And I, didn't ha I don't have any prepared testimony either. I pulled up some previous testimony, but I won't repeat much of it. Um, I think Elizabeth, I still want to call her Beth as well. You can. Elizabeth. <laughs> half my family calls me Beth and half call me Elizabeth. I think she hit the nail on the head when she talked about resources and what, we're, what are our priorities here and what should we be investing in as a state. Because I think we all agree that transparency is incredibly important. It's rooted in the Constitution. It's right there in the Public Records Act that our Government should be open and accessible and accountable to the people. And that's one way that we foster trust in what we're doing. And, and we all know trust is at a dismal level right now in government, um, you know, especially in things going on in, in DC, regardless of party. Um, and then looking at state and local government, people get uh, very cynical and, and 
don't have a lot of faith often in what their government is up to. And that's something that we face as state employees every single day. Um, you know, I'm dealing with records requests and questions about open meeting law all the time. I dealt with several of them today from people who are frustrated with the things that are ha happening. They believe there's funny business happening behind the scenes because they can't see what's going on. Um, because folks aren't following the open meeting law or the Public Records Act and seem to be secretive, even even if they don't have any, um, there's no nefarious intent there. So it's, we all know it's really important that we be open in everything that we do, subject to that balancing of certain privacy interests. Um, but it's difficult to do. I'm a 20 plus year state employee, and before I was a deputy secretary of state, uh, I was a staff attorney, and I was the director of the Office of Professional Regulation. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to transparency but I was subject to all these records requests that were annoying at best and uh, really got in the way of my work at worst. Um, but you know, what's, what's really important, it was still part of my job and I still did it and I still followed the Public Records Act and, and responded in a timely fashion and made sure that it got done, uh, even though it was inconvenient. Um, being in my position as Deputy Secretary now, I see kind of a, a bigger picture and a broader view of all the agencies and what they're dealing with and what the public is, the, the, the point of view of the public as they're coming at this. So um, I think Elizabeth is right in saying that most state agencies are trying to do the right thing, but it's, it's not their full-time job and they don't have the resources to do it. So that's where I think, you know, some of what you heard uh, last time you were here which, uh, on this issue, and I wasn't here, unfortunately, but you heard from Tanya Marshall about records management, how important that is. If you're organizing and managing your records as you go, it makes it that much easier to respond. You're not hunting for versions. You're not looking through huge stacks of paper when you've already separated the uh, the wheat from the chaff and the organize things into categories, it's a lot easier to respond. Technology is another piece of this. There are programs that make it easier for you to redact, for you to blur video, for you to do uh, the, the privacy protections that you have to do to um, obey the exemptions in the law. Um, and then it's the people. Um, I'm the records officer for the Secretary of State's office, so in my spare time, uh, I respond to records requests. I can often delegate that to people, but sometimes I can't. And uh, so I have to go through those emails and I have to go through those documents and take a look at them and see what needs to be redacted and what we can give out and what we can't. Um, so not every agency is fortunate enough to have a dedicated records, um, records manager, but as uh, the Senator pointed out earlier, everyone is supposed to have a designated records officer, someone who's the point of contact for the agency for records. But some agencies do have actually made that investment and do have embedded within uh, records professionals. Um, and I think Tanya can, can speak to some of that. There is a job series in state government for records uh, managers. I'm probably not um, saying the job title quite right. Uh, but there is a series of that as an actual job title. That's information is so important in today's day and age and uh, accountability and transparency is so important that we need to start dedicating those resources in the right places. And part of that is uh, technology and its people to be able to respond to records requests. So we really appreciate that this committee has taken the time to look at this, it comes up every every couple of years. We struggle with many of the same issues. It's really hard to thread that needle uh, to make the distinction between the so-called you know weaponized records requests and people who are of pure motive and really just trying to get to the bottom of something and doing an important service actually to the uh, to the state by asking for records and holding agencies accountable. So to make that distinction is, is a, a, a nearly impossible task, and I appreciate that you've tried to struggle with it here today. And, and, uh, but we would ask that you continue to keep um, inspections free of charge, and that when there is a charge for copies, that it's related just to the actual cost of providing those copies. And so we think um, if you don't do anything at all, we think the state of the law is uh, adequate with respect to copies and inspections. But if you do do something, that we should move to make um, public records even more open. 
perhaps consider an ombudsman, uh, perhaps consider clarifying and consolidating the many exemptions that we have spread out through all the different statutes. So again, we really appreciate all the time that you spend on this. My boss, if he was here today, would talk about his uh, platform that he's run on for many, many years around transparency and the transparency tour uh, that we do every couple of years to inform people about their right to know. We think it's critically important to a, a healthy functioning democracy and trust in government. So thank you. Chris, on average, how many requests do you get a week and how much time average does it take you to come up with <laughs> so me personally well the office I don't know if I could even tell you that it's, and, and it depends on how you define uh, requests for information versus requests for public records I know Tanya gets a ton of them at the Vermont State Archives so they actually track it there um, in the main office you know I'll also say the Office of Professional Regulation they deal with their own uh, records requests over there they get a ton of those in the main office, I will do probably a couple a week. Some of them are really um, quick, quick turnaround. You, where's the document? Here's the document. There you go. Some of them are big searches across all of the email in the Secretary of State's office for um, the panel, for example. This is a total hypothetical. There's no. Um, but we're getting a lot of requests around elections and local government. Uh, around this time of year and, uh, with the elections coming up. So, I don't know, three to five requests a week and it really depends. Like, the big email search um, can mm -hmm. take me half an hour to an hour or the one document can take me five minutes. Okay. Thanks. So I wonder if there's a middle, a third category here. So you have the, I can't remember what your two categories are. One was, um, anyway, the, the, the really big one, the investigative event, and the, and the um, kind of um, overreach one. I wonder if there's something in between that's, I mean, I'm just thinking, and I'm not sure if I can say this right, but say I introduce a bill, um, I, I don't know. I introduce a bill, and somebody asks for all the emails around that bill. What, what is the, what is the purpose of that, and the transparency of that? If I get emails from my constituents saying support, don't support, somebody has to go yeah. through and redact the, that person's name because that's a constituent that's responding, that's asking me. If I email with another legislator, I email with Brian and say, um, what about this part of the bill? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, what, what is that category? Because that really is. Something that seems like a, like a fishing expedition. Yeah, or what, what is the purpose of it anyway, to find um, out all the emails that I may have received or sent yeah. about a particular bill that isn't even being discussed. So we start with the premise that all records are public records. Mm -hmm. They belong to the people. They don't belong to the agencies that are in custody of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a Supreme Court decision that says identity or motive shouldn't be considered when you're responding. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what they want it for if it's a public record or who mm -hmm. they are doesn't matter. Even though you might have, you know, this person you might say is just trying to harass us, but this person is of pure motive. You really shouldn't look at that. That's the difficulty in threading the needle on these. It is. Um, but there is a provision in law that allows you to, to try to narrow. And I often start there is to talk to the person who's making the request and saying, I want to I want to provide you what you're looking for. Doesn't always work, depending on who it is. I want to provide you what you're looking for, and I can get it to you quicker if you can, you know, tell me specific, more specifically, what you want to know, um, and we can narrow it hopefully to some search terms or to one specific bill or one specific constituent. And the other thing I would say is you can't. Your redactions need to be based on those exemptions that are in statute. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not based on who sent it to you. I guess it could be in some instances, but it's more around other 
protected information that the legislature has said we don't give out you know personal medical information right. or a social security number or something like that or personal information from constituents i think that is a no no not not i guess i wouldn't say that in a blanket way mm -hmm. personal information i mean when somebody uh, writes to me tells me their their horrible yeah. life story and the problem they're having with an agency yeah. that yes, that's one of the other difficulties in responding is that you might need to take a look at each one of those emails to really read it and that's the most time consuming part uh, reading and redacting it, 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 depending on the request but that can be very time consuming I understand that's a huge burden on agencies and on the state but we think that burden is appropriately placed on the state and not we shouldn't put a big paywall in front of that for the public to access those records just because they have to be reviewed and redacted it is, I understand that. I just don't know why anybody would care what I think about emoji bills <laughs> or emoji on um, license plates. Yeah. You know, why, why anybody has an interest in that and for what possible yeah. transparency. For, anyway, that's... And in, in the cases of those big email requests, there are there is technology available, so you can do a, a kind of behind-the-scenes search that can help you do it more efficiently. You can search for keywords, and then the records management piece that I'm not good at, but everyone is going to need to get used to doing. I think is um, you know sort of sorting and organizing those as they come in. The technology is there to sort them into different folders to say you know everything related to this bill goes there. I know I don't do it either, but. There are ways. When you get 150 or 200 of them a day, uh, <laughs> yep. no way. Yep. Um, so I just w thought remembered when um, the VY thing was going on, mm -hmm. and they had a suit against the state, and they asked for certain legislators to. Well, we were all asked to save all our emails about VY, and then they picked certain ones and asked for them. Michael Grady, who was our our public records guy at the time. Claire Eyre was one of them, and he went through all her emails, and his response to her was, you legislators aren't nearly as interesting as you think you are. <laughs> 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 because there really wasn't anything there. So, anyway. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We keep thinking we come up with solutions. Brian, three oh. times, has come up with the perfect solution, and then it's somebody... Hard. Not yeah, I, I have to say uh, the testimony we took last week basically from our media colleagues was, I thought, compelling and uh, the ACLU weighed in and I was ready to go down a certain path with, yeah. I didn't care who followed me and who didn't, I was going to go. But then a few people tapped me on the shoulder and said, did you think about this? And I went, oh, no. And so there's no, it appears, easy solution here. You could come up with a standard fee, and there's still examples of when that wouldn't work. You right. can come up with a, a temporal guide if it takes you more than a half hour, an hour, or a day. And there are examples where that just doesn't work. So I, I don't know what to do. We're not that smart, I guess. No, I think, it's, I think it's smarter people before or have, have struggled with this and not been able to come up with the the appropriate balance. I think what we have is, is pretty good. Um, I think the way that it stands as we get more and more of these requests, it is forcing some some innovation and some better records management and adapting technology and, and getting people on board with understanding this is the new normal. Um, and it's sort of a, a survival mechanism of sorts where necessity is the mother of invention here. And I hope we're all getting better and hopefully we'll invest more in good records management, good technology, and being able to respond to these requests. Yeah, and I, I mean, it was probably even, the public records uh, law was first passed in 65? No, 75, right around the right Watergate around time. That's right. And um, I, I, my guess is most things were either on a tape, which we know what happens to 18 minutes of tapes, right. or 13 or whatever it was, <laughs> And um, or in pa on pieces of paper, but now, I mean, what even is a record? If I don't use social media, 
So I don't have, except for email, but I don't, I don't think that's even called social media. No. <laughs> okay, so see, I don't know. Uh, for the record, it's Tanya Marshall, I'm the state archivist. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on Chris's testimony related to the job series. There's a records and information management job series in the state of Vermont. Um, it started off with the creation of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, but we've expanded it to all agencies and departments. Um, and the way it's worded, we keep amending it. It does include public records requests, but it includes managing the records as well. So in many ways, you know, Chris and I respond to requests very differently because we, with the state archives, we know what's in our records. We're not, we're not responding, we're not reacting to a situation where someone's giving us a request and then deciding to understand what's inside the records or doing that um, upon retrieval or upon um, access. Uh, the records and information management specialist um, Besides those and my staff, I actually allocate, I have 17 staff members to do everything that we do, which is not just records and information management. We, we manage three repositories, we do administrative rules, we do legislative clerking, we do vital records for the Department of Health. Um, there are about eight or nine people on my staff. I actually took one FTE and placed that person inside human services as full time. Um, and the leaps and bounds that that agency has made with one FTE has been amazing. And so we have an agreement with them that as of July of this year, they're gonna find a vacancy, which I'm assuming an agency the size of the Agency of Human Services and all its departments should be able to do that. But that person's gonna transfer there. And we have the Department of Public Safety on agreement waiting for that vacancy to happen. Um, total in the state is about nine people. The only person, <laughs> the only department that actually hired uh, specifically on their own is Department of Corrections. That's fairly new. Our, um, our records and information management specialist works directly with him, kind of revising him on public, how to do the public records request, but largely managing as well. The record schedules um, that we are responsible for pushing out in law is actually a management plan. It's not just record retention and um, disposition. Um, I've been looking at, you know, what are ways to make it more efficient for public records requesters to know what an agency has or which agency has the record um, and how to make that request framed. Some other states use their record schedules. So requesters make requests knowing kind of which set of records the agency, because those schedules are done. If you look at how many agencies have engaged in the scheduling process with, this, with us since we've been created, it's very low. So the recommendation to actually use those management plans to their advantage are not there. Um, we allocate resources across the board. Our, our room specialists are accommodating many different agencies right now. Um, we're, you know, we're obviously have a lot of agencies that we provide support to, but we're always able to get them into the record scheduling. Um, sometimes there's, you know, delays and fits and starts based on staffing and availability and and so forth, but those management tools and why we were kind of created were to facilitate that. So it does go hand in hand. Um, it's just that we have huge gaps to even make some recommendations to make it easier. Um, but in comparison for maybe the nine represent information management specialists in the entire state, how many IT people are within the state? How many attorneys? How many business managers? So there really is a um, an issue with in terms of personnel and allocating the resources. Um, but I have seen, and if you wanted, I would probably recommend inviting the Agency of Human Services to come in. Human Resources, you mean? Uh, human, human Services. What is the Agency of Human Oh, H That's where we allocate. We allocate HS. one of okay. our, um, yes, and Donald Tool Chief Operations oh. Officer and I are the co-leads on that particular. It's a steering committee. They meet every single month. Um, and we tackle all sorts of information technology issues and how to make sure that records can be managed more effectively. They do state um, agency-wide scheduling. It has grown in 18 months of that allocation, just leaps and bounds. Um, one FTE, my payroll, but happy to do it. Um, but I think that was a really good success story. They have gone from a one to a two and three. Um, on the maturity model for uh, information governance. So again, it goes hand in hand. There are some ways to make sure, on the flip side, for records uh, request, how to frame that, but those come from having really good record schedules, which aren't just retention and disposition. It really itemizes, at a high level, like a bucket, the types of records that each agency has based on the function that they do. How much um, clout do you have for <coughs> 
the agencies and departments. Uh, follow the record schedule. Oh, you're laughing. Oh, so. Question. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> How much cloud do you have? So, well, the record schedules are required by law. And but it happens since 30 But they're not following them. Um, right. Okay. I, I don't, so you don't have any cloud? Uh, the only, the carrot that I used to have is a record sensor. If you want to use the state record sensor, by law, you have to have a record schedule. So that still happens. Um, I know that, you know, working collaboratively with the Agency of Digital Services, because they're kind of the successor to the paper, they're the, they're the new record sensor, right? They're the ones that manage the systems. And, um, but it is, it's about, it's, to me, it's about that one resource being in there. And um, when they see the difference, and it, it does make a difference. But I don't have much, I don't have any teeth to force it, um, which is unfortunate because I think it would make a huge benefit. And you also don't have any teeth to force them having a records management person. I mean, having following the schedule and having the person and right there's one on. section in law that requires agencies and departments that are underneath the governor's cabinet to have an active and continuing records management program and that's the one law that requires them to assign a member of their staff as records officer but again it's a duty is otherwise assigned to how we would right. say it and classified um but we just working sometimes with our records and information management specialists drives the need that they recognize that they value that particular position and wanted to have it. They're not necessarily going to vacate or have the means to vacate, and it's very difficult to create a position in state government right now, so you really have to make a decision. Um, but they often have the resources sometimes to do it, they just don't have the ability to make the position to happen. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we should um, have somebody from the administration. I, I don't know if it would be the chief performance officer or the secretary of administration. Somebody come in and talk to us about how we can put more teeth out. My recommendation, if you wanted just some insight, would be to, um, like I said, Human Services has seen that. They also, Corrections, um, underneath that has hired its own records and information management special that works collaboratively to lead with us. And then Department of Public Safety, I'm actually their, their as our assigned uh, records and information management specialist, because we're just kind of short staffed. And last year, the body cam came up, the dash cam, all those particular issues on managing them. and. Um, so I've been working with them directly on their records management policy, and we've just seen them kind of grow in the last six months. So it doesn't make an immediately good success necessarily in the public records request, but we work collectively with their um, public um, records officer, which is a little bit different um, labor underneath the administration um, to help her locate records and, and better manage them. I just wanted to clarify the part about the position. So mm -hmm. you know that there's a there's a whole job series out there. Okay. Four nine lines. people. <laughs> for the record, Jay Diaz from the ACLU, thank you uh, for having me again. I just wanted to to comment quickly on um, uh, a couple of things I heard today and then and, uh, a couple of things that the ACLU has been uh, advocating for for a number of years and, and just let you know about those. Uh, includes some of the pieces of Senator Brock's bill. Uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, uh, really caution everyone around, you know, this concern about the, you know, gigantic request. Uh, I mean, because it, in terms of what I've heard about any of these requests, which I've only heard about one or two, they've always been a request for a copy, and so they've always been charged. The person requesting that always has to pay for that. Um, so I haven't seen that actually happen in the instance of the agency has to expend a lot of resources and not receive anything in return. Um, by and large, my experience in making requests, which I've made a lot, and my uh, experience representing requesters is that, you know, Vermonters are reasonable. We work with agencies regularly to try to narrow our requests, we're not trying to hurt anyone or sap resources or, or weaponize the Public Records Act. Uh, it, it, it's, it's for the people in order to access government information, and I think that's how Vermonters see it. Um, uh, and then the last thing I mentioned in my testimony a couple weeks ago is that 
In these instances, if they do come up around large requests, there's always the option for a public entity of any kind to go and ask a court to enjoin them having to actually put forth the information. Um, I would, under the absurd results doctrine, uh, I think if, if following through with the requester's um, ask would mean that it would harm the agency in some, some substantial way or prevent them from doing their job uh, in some substantial way, I think the court would be very sympathetic. Um, so that's an avenue that they can go down. Bottom line, the position of the ACLU is that the current mechanism that we have for accessing public records post Doyle, and I would argue that it was this way before Doyle, uh, is satisfactory. Uh, it's, not, it's not great in terms of transparency, but it's not bad. Uh, it allows Vermonters to access information uh, on an equal playing field. And I think that that's, what, that's, that's the balance that, that you all have struck. And I think it's a satisfactory balance at this point. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on that or just move forward quickly. No, no, continue. I have another okay. question. Sure. Um, so just, you know, in terms of the list of issues we've focused on in the past, this committee and, and the legislature took up some of them a couple of years ago. And we're thankful for those uh, around uh, this, the schedule of responses and Vaughn indexes, um, you know, letting us know what's been redacted and why. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times still, <laughs> despite the strong language you all put in law, um, those are regularly disregarded. Uh, I have yet to receive a Vaughn index without asking for it, and many others are in the same position. Um, so, you know, it may be necessary to have teeth there, or, or we may need to have a case about it at some point from some entity, but I just want to make you all aware of that. There are other issues, um, and, and I can send you an updated um, list of issues that we think need to be addressed in the Public Records Act, uh, so I'll forward that, that to you all. Um, regarding Senator Brock's bill, uh, we, in 2014, filed on behalf of Prison Legal News a lawsuit against uh, CCA, which is now CoreCivic, um, the private prison entity that the state contracts with. Uh, we sued for public records from CCA, which you know is a private corporation. Um, they argued in a motion to dismiss that we are not a public entity, so you don't get to ask us for public records. And the Washington Superior Court here said, no, you're doing a governmental function with, with state dollars. Um, you know, and it had a four-part test. Uh, I think Steve discussed this before and said the public gets to look at, at certain records that are, that, are, you know, um, that you create in the, in the course of your business. Um, so I would say that, that by and large, that is the state of the law. And I think, I would guess most entities see it that way. Um, you know, I'm a little hesitant to go as far as you know, just uh, just an entity that's received that that gets a grant from from the state um, to do a specific kind of work, uh, unless it's around this particular financials of that or something like that. Because I don't want to we don't want to inhibit entities from accessing state resources in order to do good work. Um, so I, you know, I, I want to uh, I'm a little wary of that. But uh, but in the end. Um, ensuring that entities that are doing these traditional government functions, uh, in particular those involved in, uh, in prisons and uh, potentially healthcare and others, um, you know, we would be in favor of those being subject to the Public Records Act. And by and large, think they already are. So that would include anybody that performs services and then gets paid for for services provided, or I mean, I'm thinking of, for example, the designated agencies. They um, get a this is some grants and then some fee for services, and um, so a fee for service is different than a. I, I don't know. I I don't know. It's been a perennial question, and I don't think they're going to like it. But uh, but I think we would. You know, we, you know, we think that uh, given the traditional function that they're doing and that um, and the amount of funding they receive, the amount of funding that of, of what their business or what their model is, um, it may be it may be 
important to think about whether they should be subject to the Public Records Act. Why did we take this up? <laughs> Remind me. <laughs> Law enforcement is much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I don't know what I was going to ask. <laughs> no, I know. It just, um, I mean, I think given the, so my question for you, I guess, is you said the way things are now yeah. seems to be working. So we, if I asked to inspect a record, the prep time of, of that is not charged to me because I'm just inspecting it. If I ask for a copy of even two pages of that, once I get it, then can I be charged for the prep time on it or just charged for those two copies? Because we heard from the different agencies do it differently. Some of them charge for the prep time for the copy, but not the prep time for the inspection which doesn't seem at all reasonable. And I think that's where the issue came up with the taking of the, because that they're not asking for a record, they're making their own record. And so uh, I think the way, and I talked about this a couple weeks ago, I think, is that this is the mechanism we've chosen. There are many different ways that states decide to provide free access to public records. Um, and many, uh, uh, and so, and this is the one that Vermont chose to make inspection free of charge. And when you're going to ask for a copy, it's it, you can be charged. And I think that goes to, um, as I mentioned, you know, Vermonters are likely to be the only ones asking to inspect because they're here. Um, it's going to be local people. You know, someone from out of state is not going to ship someone here to do the records request necessarily uh, to do a inspection um, at least I mean that's it just seems right. like that's that would be the common sense response from from us so I think that's that's why and I think it, it makes sense to some extent um, there are other mechanisms that you could look into uh, but there are plenty of states that do it this way and have done it for for decades and how about the taking of the picture then this is this is a, a, obviously a new area, so I don't. There's yeah. not as much uh, looking into it. I mean, I w as as we've said, um, the idea that taking a picture costs the state something, I don't think is is uh, and allows for someone to charge is appropriate, uh, and we, we don't think it's in the interest of transparency and accountability to do that. Again, these are the locals who are doing the inspecting and taking a picture. This is. I, I can tell you when I make a record risk, I'm not going to be the one who's going in and taking pictures. I, I want copies of documents. I want things I can put into court um, that are uh, you know, easy to see and things like that. I think people taking pictures of, of documents are going to be you know, everyday Vermonters. Uh, and, and I don't even know if it's actually even come up. I think there was, you know, there was a policy that the AG's office put out, but I still haven't heard about actual examples or multiple examples of this happening. Um, it doesn't seem to be that this is a, a major problem that is that that requires an immediate solution in, in the way that, at least in my experience and how and what I what I understand. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, take it up again. Keep working on it, and um, Tucker will have all the answers for us next week. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.